Shalom, brothers and sisters. For this week's Thursday thought, I want to ask you a question, and that is, is Mormonism salvageable? Is Mormonism worth saving? Now, I know Mormonism has been controversial since the very beginning. It was at a time when science and magic were kind of separating. I mean, that, that's what, that had been happening for a long time. Don't get me wrong. But science was starting to really gain a lot of ground and the superstition was starting to leave religion. And when I say that, I know there's a lot of people who will say, religion is still very superstitious. Except that back then there were still people practicing folk magic and that's really frowned upon in Christianity today. And folk magic is really where Mormonism got its start. And there's a lot of people that are drawn to Latter-day Saint movement and they get really disappointed once they dig into the churches that exist today and realize that they also have abandoned that magical worldview, as Michael Quinn so eloquently put it. And the controversy may start there, but it definitely doesn't end there. We were very controversial in you know, the original church because we went to Missouri and we were anti-slavery. And that caused a lot of political problems. We engaged in polygamy in Nauvoo in secret, and that caused problems both in the movement itself and with, you know, it was, it was not legal in that state. And then when the church divided, I mean, I also you know, keep in mind Joseph Smith's having all these revelations, this idea of gold plates, you know, it's all very controversial. And then when the church split, you had all these different factions, right? Brigham Young took the people Nauvoo out west. They had the... I wouldn't say they had the money. They weren't like rich. They probably had more money than the rest of them, but that wasn't a lot of money. Not like it is now. But they had the people, and so they were able to create this illusion that that they were the, the actual successor to the original church. Then you have James Strang, who really moved that magical worldview forward, translating new plates and continuing to receive revelation. Uh, Sidney Rigdon, he continued the... the uh, well. The women in that church received revelation and lots of people received revelation. It was a lot more like uh, Joseph's church in that that regard. And 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 there were others. I'm not gonna get into all of them here. Those are those are the big three that people know. I mean, the Cutlerites were were pretty large, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But by the time the reorganized church came around and then Joseph Smith the third joined that church and became the pragmatic prophet that he was. Mormonism was really losing those roots, and we began to be known for polygamy because of the people out west, and and um, James Strang also to an extent, and then the reorganized church and, and other churches were very very against polygamy, of course, and so was there. That was a, a big dividing factor. Rigdon claimed that Joseph Smith was a fallen prophet because he engaged in polygamy. Uh, Joseph Smith the third claimed that. He never was a polygamist. And of course, Brigham Young took whatever Joseph Smith said that in any way reflected even, no matter how small he reflected, whatever it was he wanted to teach, including strange doctrines that aren't accepted anymore, like the Adam-God doctrine, and, and, and kind of twisted his words into, into whatever it is that he wanted, rather than having his own, receiving his own prophecies, which growing up in that church, I always thought was kind of odd. And then later on, the polygamy thing is still around. You know, there are still polygamists. Technically, I, I know that the, the proclamation of the family says one man, one woman. I I think that's kind of hypocritical, honestly, because there's polygamists that sign that piece of paper. There may be spiritual polygamists, but they still have more than one wife. They're still polygamists. And then you have the ban on blacks. Of course, Joseph Smith didn't have that. He didn't believe in slavery. He ordained black men. And I don't know if he ordained any black women. I know he ordained women, but, you know, just like uh, Strang and Rigdon did to some extent. But then Young squashed all that. And because his was the largest movement, the controversies continued. We're going to move away from the folk magic stuff and we're going to move towards just outright misogyny, bigotry. And now today, homophobia, transphobia, just, just all these these problems. And it's like, Man, why, why do we want to continue with this? Why do we want to push this movement forward? Is it salvageable? And, and 
I, I've, I've been getting that question quite a bit. It's ever since we put out uh, over the weekend the um, statement of inclusion, the video, the statement of inclusion itself was released in June of this year, but we put out a video and in it, there's a, a, a big thing that says Black Lives Matter and that offended people that I, I, uh, I don't know, they're saying all lives matter, which technically is correct, but the way that they're saying it is saying that Black Lives don't matter. And then you have the people who are saying, oh, well, you're showing a rainbow flag. That's anti-Mormon. You need to follow the prophet and realize that those people, they don't deserve equal rights. They don't deserve equality. Well, the Lord told us in Revelation the Fellowship that, that they, in fact, do. And so, therefore, we can't go in that same direction with them. But Mormonism is so small. And the Fellowship is <laughs> even so much smaller, smaller than, I mean, there are some smaller groups out there, but not many. Most groups of Latter-day Saints are going to be larger in the fellowship and definitely better organized. And what did they look like? They look controversial. It's a lot of people who don't want to ordain women, still are kind of questioning about the blacks. And, of course, polygamy. Either Joseph Smith... They, they, you know, they're against you if you say he was a polygamist and and then they're against you if you say that he, he was. There's just so much fighting. Why, why go on? Why continue? Well, uh, the reason why I am going on is because I believe it is worth saving. I read King Benjamin's address and I see the gospel of Jesus Christ. If someone were to just take that alone out of the Book of Mormon, it's it's the pure gospel of Jesus Christ in that address. When you see in Third Nephi, Jesus blessing the children. Yeah, his teachings are from the New Testament. It's the same stuff. Why, why would it why would it be different? That wouldn't make any sense. But him blessing the children like that, healing people. I mean, these people went through a traumatic experience with everything, cities being destroyed, and God himself came down to give them hope. The teachings of Mormon in the Book of Moroni, that all good things come from God, and all things that are wicked come from Satan. And that is something that I wrestled with growing up. If that statement is true, then could the church that I belong to, is what I asked myself back in the day, have been of God knowing that they had racial discrimination? And as an adult, I had to ask the same question with their homophobic views. The transphobia hadn't really shown up yet. In fact, I would say that the proclamation of the family is actually pro-trans rights because it talks about this idea that the spirit is eternal. And so the body could just be wrong. That's, that's, that's an interesting idea for why transgender people exist. But the idea that we should be discriminating against other people and that that's somehow the gospel of Jesus Christ, I, I can't call that Mormonism. I can say that the churches of men take Mormonism and twist it and they say, we need to hate these people. We're going to say we love them and that we just don't like them. No, 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 no. It's not that we don't like them. It's that we don't like what they're doing. Sorry, a little slip up there. But when you take two people that are in love and you can feel the love, you feel the Holy Spirit in that love. And you say, I I'm, I'm sorry, you can't marry because you're not the same race, which is a ridiculous idea, which they don't do anymore because you're both the same gender. Well, eventually they'll churn around. Eventually they'll stop doing that. But if we are churches as in the Latter-day Saint movement that are led by revelation, if we're going to do it, why aren't we doing it now? Why does the Lord allow satanic doctrines of bigotry and hate into our movement? Well, 
I, I think the reason is quite simple. Because we as human beings bring it. We bring it to the table. We put it in dishes and we serve it. But we don't have to accept what we're given. And we don't have to pass it along. And that is the point of the statement of inclusion. No, we're not building a church. We're just not. I'm not. If you want a church, Alan wants to build a church, and he wants your help. I want to build a school of the prophets because we've got to have people trained to do anything before we can have anything. But what we need is a place for cross-pollination where people from different portions of the restoration can come in and say, we are Mormon too. We are also Latter-day Saints and we can learn from one another. That's what the School of the Prophets is. The School of the Prophets isn't about teaching people to believe whatever Dave Fairman believes. The School of the Prophets is about taking ideas and discussing them as Latter-day Saints from our different backgrounds and then taking what we learn back to our churches. And then you've got some interesting things from the community of Christ being taught in the Salt Lake City Church and some interesting things from the Salt Lake City Church being taught in the Temple Lot Church and some interesting things from the Temple Lot Church being taught in, in a Rigdonite Church and et cetera, et cetera, and so on and so forth. That's how we fix this broken movement. And I'm going to tell you right now, the biggest problem that we have, what has allowed this to occur, is that we ignore Mormon's promise. What's Mormon's promise? If you pray on the Book of Mormon, God will tell you if it's true or not, right? What's, what's Mormon's promise? That God is the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow, and that the days of miracles have not ceased well, if that's true, then the folk magic that brought this movement to life is still around. But folk magic doesn't sound good, right? Especially for church and a movement that people think of as tied to the occult. So what if we called it miracle working? Because that's what the early saints called it. That's what it says in the Book of Mormon, the days of miracles. Brothers and sisters, I want to testify to you that the gospel of Jesus Christ is alive. And as long as there are just a handful of saints that are willing to testify and live that gospel of Jesus Christ, it cannot be taken from the earth. I know that there are groups out there that say they're the only ones of the priesthood. Other people lost it because they did X, Y, and Z. That is, that is not true. All branches of the Latter-day Saint movement have whatever portion of the priesthood they require to move their portion of the movement forward. And I testify to, to, of that to you in the name of Jesus Christ. The question is, are we willing to use those keys to move this movement forward? I remember growing up being told that Mormonism was the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And Joseph Smith is a, is a quote by him saying that you know, it's, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ of which he is not ashamed. Sorry if I didn't get that perfect. I'm doing it from memory. And that crosses were bad. David O. McKay said they were too, too Catholic. It was very, very anti-Catholic back then. Mormons jumped on that bandwagon. The Salt Lake City Church, I should say, jumped on that bandwagon. Used the Book of Mormon to promote the anti-Catholic. Always promoting the against somebody stuff. I, I don't get it. But now, being a Mormon is a victory for Satan, according to their church. Their Prophet President Nelson has said that whenever someone says Mormon, it's a victory for Satan, which means that he did not have a testimony of Gordon B. Hinckley. I still sustain him as an apostle of Jesus Christ and as the president of their church. I, I don't think that he was a Satan worshiper. 
I don't think that his I'm a Mormon campaign was a victory for Satan by any stretch of the imagination. Nor do I think that Joseph Smith was a Satan worshiper for being a Mormon. Not a big fan of Brigham Young, but I don't think he was a Satan worshiper for being a Mormon and claiming to be a Mormon either. So I, I will have to agree to disagree on that one. But back to the cross, they, the Salt Lake City Church on Google I saw recently, they are moving from the Angel Moroni on their little little dots to show where their church buildings are to a cross just like every other Christian church. Now, in one aspect, that's great. We, we want inclusion. We want other Christians to know that we accept them as Christians, whether they accept us or not. However, we don't want to commit ourselves to obscurity by removing all of the things that make us unique, because at that point, there will be no need for Mormonism anymore. You close the Doctrine and Covenants to any book of canon, and Revelation is now irrelevant. Inspiration is still there. Every Christian church has inspiration, but Revelation is gone. You remove the term Mormonism. You remove the term Latter-day Saint from us as a people and as churches. And we're just another Christian church. We're not special. We're not unique. You stop emphasizing the Book of Mormon. You can get the Bible anywhere. Why do you need to get it from us? You don't. I'll be frank, you don't. I believe that every Christian minister is inspired. Whether they listen to the inspiration or not, that's a different thing. But they're all inspired. So without the Book of Mormon, as that second witness of Jesus Christ, you don't really need us anymore. You can use whatever logo you want. You want to use Angel Moroni? Go for it. You want to use a cross? Go for it. I, I use a cross myself. You see it in fellowship stuff all the time. I don't wear a cross anymore, but but I, I do see it as, as a symbol of our religion because we're Christians. I also see the fish as a symbol of our religion. At the end of the day, though, the world doesn't need us to be exclusive because there's already tons of of exclusion going on everywhere. They need us to be unique. And the uniqueness of Mormonism in Joseph Smith's time was letting freed slaves worship right alongside white saints. And then ordaining freed slaves and sending them out on missions. That was unheard of. That was radically progressive for that time. Can we get back to being those people again? Can we get back to the point to where we are so against injustice that we are literally thrown out of a state and told, with, with the citizens of that state being told, you can shoot Mormons on sight because of their anti-slavery views. Can we get back to being those people? Because that's my Mormonism. My Mormonism is miracle working. It's revelation and not merely inspiration. And it's radical justice where we're willing to stand with the oppressed and fight with them. So I will ask my question one last time. And that is, is Mormonism salvageable? Are we willing to step up to the plate and be Latter-day Saints and be Mormons and tell the people who are marginalized and oppressed, I've got your back. I stand with you because I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ and it's what Jesus would do. Are you a Mormon? I am. That's my Thursday thought for you. And I leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.